chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that i would be set I sing for all that you've done for me. And worthy is the Lamb who slain. And worthy is the King, He conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who slain. And worthy is the King, He conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. And worthy is the King, He conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me all that you've done for me Awesome is the 
bless the Lord most high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How awesome is the Lord most high. Raise your hands on the nation. Shout to God all creation. How awesome is the Lord most high. We will praise you together for now and forever. How awesome is the Lord most high. Raise your hands on the nation. First, you go before, you are the last, Lord, you're the encore, your name and light for all to see, the starry host declares your glory, glory in the highest. Glory in the highest Glory in the highest Apart from you There is no God Light of the world The bright and morning star Your name will shine Yeah. 
Good morning. It's good to see so many out today. Jesus is the Lamb of God. We all know that. But what does it mean? Well, lambs were com commonly sacrificed under the law of Moses. And Jesus was sacrificed. That's true, but is that all there is to it? Lambs could be sacrificed under the law for several different reasons and on different occasions. We just kind of assumed that the idea of Jesus as a lamb is about sacrifice for forgiveness for sin. And that's certainly a very, very true point. That's a good lesson. But there's another one. Jesus is also referred to as a Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 7. I mean, verse 7. And 1 Peter 1, verse 19. The Passover lamb was sacrificed, but in a very different way from the temple sacrifices. The Passover lamb was killed and then eaten as part of the Passover meal. It was sacrificed because the meal was dedicated to God, but not because the lamb was burned up or left for the priests. The family making the sacrifices was allowed to keep and eat that they had given to God. Unlike atonement sacrifices, where the slaughtered animal was surrendered to God, this sacrifice was kept and eaten in memory of the first Passover. The night of the tenth plague in which God took the lives of firstborn of every household, other than those that spread the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and their lintels. The blood was a sign of loyalty to God. It's how God determined whom to guard and whom to destroy. Now Ray Vanderlaan points out that ancient Christ, uh, Egyptians would have found that the use of blood, animal blood in such a way disgusting. They considered it as offensive to their gods. The Israelites who spread blood on their door frames risked death by mob action. And here's the lesson. The way the Israelites thought and obtained God's protection was by doing the very opposite of staying safe. They did something reckless, even suicidal. They were slaves in Egypt, and after nine plagues, they surely hated. They were surely hated. And God told them to risk their lives, not only advertising their loyalty to God, but on their doors a very public display. But also by doing in that way, guaranteed to bring hatred, disgust, and even death. Do you want God to keep you safe? Then maybe call God's... Let me, let me... Then maybe God calls you to do something dangerous scary and deadly. You see, God was teaching the Israelites a vital lesson. They were about to travel across the deadly desert to be pushed by the Egyptian army without enough water or food to make it. And this was going to be how they seek God's protection and safety, to prepare them to help build their faith in God's protection. God began by insisting they make crazy, dangerous, and even suicidal decisions. And those who made decisions were indeed kept safe and soon escaped slavery. When we take this meal here, a meal derived of the Passover, we often express our gratitude to God for the living in the land free of prosecution, but only free of prosecution because we've done, we've don't threaten anyone. We don't do anything to give offense. Indeed, we often far more con concerned about our reputation than our faithfulness to God. But Jesus li lived a crazy, 
dangerous, and even suicidal life. He paid with his life. And yet, even though his enemies killed him, God's, God protected him and kept him safe, even in death. When we take this meal, we should see it as preparation for the same sort of thing. A crazy, dangerous, even suicidal life. We should see this as a moment when, like the ancient Israelites, we pledge ourselves to be faithful, whatever the cost. And if our faithfulness costs us family, friends, if it costs us criticism, and even hatred from people we wish loved us, well, that's what it's about. This is the body and blood of someone who died because he preferred faithfulness to safety. The dangerous, true gospel to the safety, false, all, all, adulterate, comfortable gospel taught by so many others. Does taking communion in this church bring prosecution, slander, criticism, dissension, and even crazy danger? It should. That's where this meal began. And when Jesus reinvented it, the Passover, by becoming the Passover lamb himself, that was the point. And countless Christians have been martyred over centuries because he, they dared to take communion. We eat the blood, blood, body and the blood of Jesus. We eat the offense. We eat the death. We eat the faith that is so strong we'll suffer laughter lost family, lost friends, and even scorn and hatred. We also be faithful to our Lord because there is no real safety, no real comfort anywhere else but our Lord. Shortly the men will come forward and distribute the cope and the loaf. Uh, take these and hold them and, and we'll partake of unison upon the reading of the word.
Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. today remembering that it's because you were willing to become the Passover lamb, the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for us, that we can come together and, and stand here before you being worthy to partake of this loaf and the cup. Lord, it's because of your sacrifice that, that we can be reunited with you, that we can stand before you redeemed, not in our own not in our own worth or our own value, but in the, in the righteousness of, of Christ Jesus. So, Lord, help us to remember our sin. Help us to remember uh, that what you did. Lord, help us to come humbly and, and thankfully to this table. Lord, we, we thank you for all your love for us. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And we thank you for Christ Jesus, our Lord. In his name we pray.
Therefore, I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat and drink of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we're so thankful for all the ways that you bless us. We're blessed every day down to our, our very breath. Lord, now we have the opportunity to give back in the form of a tithe. I pray that we do so generously and with a cheerful heart and that all funds collected are used wisely and according to your will to further your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name. Good morning. I think this morning we should start things off with a Russian proverb. Don't we all start our mornings with Russian proverbs? There's a Russian proverb that tells a story about a hunter who was hunting bear in the wilderness. And he finally came across, after searching and searching, a very large Russian bear. And he carefully took aim at the bear and had him dead to rights. But right before he was about to pull the trigger, the bear turned and spoke in a soft, smoothing voice. The bear said, isn't it better to talk than to shoot? Isn't it better to talk than to kill? What do you want? Let's negotiate on the matter. Lowering his rifle, the hunter said, all I want is a fur coat. Good, the bear said. That's a very negotiable question. I only want a full stomach. So let us sit down and negotiate. So they sat down in the middle of the forest to negotiate. And after some time, the bear got up and walked away alone. The negotiations had been a huge success. The bear had a full stomach and the hunter had his full coat. Most of you got it. Compromising important things can cost you more than you can afford sometimes. For Christians, re-risk 
compromising away our souls when we sit down and try to make deals with the devil. And that's exactly what the next two churches in our study of the seven churches in Revelation have done. Perganium and Theatria, they were both in danger of doing this. And I want to go ahead and dive right in and read about these two churches. And we're going to read about both of them together. So it's going to be quite a lengthy passage, but stick with me. There's a lot of similarities that overlap with these two churches. It's Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 29. To the angel in the church of Perganium write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak, who enticed the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. To the church in Thyatria, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bit of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatria, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold you unto what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's a lot to digest. That's a lot to pick apart. And Jesus has quite a bit to say to these two churches. For for Perganium, they remain Christians despite despite living in in an official center of emperor worship. You remember from our very first lesson A lot of these churches are dealing with the same issue, the issue of emperor worship. The emperor in Rome has established that all Caesars and emperors from now on should be regarded and worshipped as gods. And, of course, this runs counter to everything that Christians know and believe and what the Lord commands them. But despite living in that environment and despite even having some of their own fellow believers put to death, martyred for the faith, despite that, they remain faithful to the Lord. However, for some reason, they are slowly allowing false teachers to creep into the church, and they're beginning to allow scripture to be twisted and for doctrine to be twisted. Now, for Thyatria, they were a church that loved to serve in love. They were a loving church. They were a faithful church, and from what we can pull away from it. They were a church that loved to serve others and to help those in need. They were a church that went out and did great work for the Lord. But at the same time, they too were allowing dangerous teachers to come in and have their way with teaching falsehoods. Both churches were falling for a common heresy that was going around at the time, a heresy that said you can mix Christianity with paganism. 
And what would often happen is that you mix Christ with other idols. And these Christians thought, well, I am saved by Jesus Christ, and I have freedom now, and I'm going to use that freedom, and I have the freedom to do whatever I want, which includes a whole host of sexual and moral things, and I can also eat food that's been sacrificed to idols, and I can go to these temples and that temple because I've been saved. I'm free to do whatever. They thought they were free to sin. Now, this is actually a a thought that still is believed in some circles to a lesser degree. But it's a problem. And there's a big problem. And here is our big problem. It's simple. When we compromise our standards, we compromise our relationship with Jesus. And let me reiterate, it's not our standards alone. It is the standards that God has given to us. The standards and by which we live by and believe in, these are the things that have been passed down by God. So when we say we, when we compromise our standards, it's actually we are compromising God's standards. But when we do that, we're on risky ground. We're on shaky ground. Because we are starting to compromise our relationship with Jesus. When Jesus was talking to these two churches, what did he tell them they needed to do? They needed to repent. He didn't say, oh, you silly guys, you're doing bad things. You're still good. Don't worry. No, he's telling them to repent. Because Jesus Christ has standards for the church. We've talked about this. There are standards by which Jesus commands us and expects us to follow. And he commands us to repent. So when we ignore his callings for repentance, and we are compromising and starting to weaken the faith and the lives that we are supposed to live for Jesus, we are compromising our relationship with him. Because sin itself, the consequence, is not just death, eternal death, but it's also breaking our relationship with God. That's what sin did in the beginning, and that's what sin always does. Sin is a barrier between us and God. Now, what is the fix to this problem? We fix this problem by maintaining what God has given us by keeping what we have strong. We first need to maintain God's standards of doctrine. And all doctrine is, is the right teachings. Don't be scared of the word doctrine. Some people think it's a scary word or a theological word. No, doctrine doctrine simply means right teachings. In other words, what Jesus and his apostles have taught you through scripture, that is doctrine. That is what you're supposed to believe in, to believe in the right teachings. Paul told Timothy in both of his letters to him to watch his life and his doctrine closely. Timothy was a young man. Paul was a much older, experienced, grizzled, beaten down Christian. He knew what Timothy was going to go through in this life. And I believe that those books are so essential to all Christians, but especially those who lead in his church. Because as long as the church lives in this world, we will be tempted to compromise the doctrines of God's words. And it makes you wonder, that you can ask yourself these questions, why did the early church deal with so much controversy and so much heresy? Why has the church over the course of 1,800 years splintered into thousands of denominations with different teachings and beliefs? And why do so many have such weak faith today? It all comes down to the answer being that because we have compromised. We have compromised something that the Lord has held up as a standard. Some of the largest churches and the most famous and wealthiest preachers in this country hardly talk about sin or redemption. They hardly talk about heaven or hell. They hardly talk about right and wrong. Now, why is that? Because that stuff doesn't sell to the people they're trying to sell to. Instead, they compromise on God's word and they water it down until it is cheap, weak, and easy to sell. And brothers and sisters, many in our nation are buying it. We are buying so much of this watered down, compromised word of God. To to the point where we could probably be fair to say it's not the word of God. It's heresy wrapped in a bow to look like the word of God. These two churches likely wanted relief. These two churches lived in very harsh environments. Just like all the churches we're talking about, they were dealing with outside pressure 
to worship the emperor. And in some cases, that turned into physical violence or even economic pressures. People would lose their job, not have the opportunity to make a living. They would lose their wife. Their families would be divided. They would be ostracized by their communities. They wanted a break. They wanted the violence to go away and the business to come back. They allowed twisted teachings to coming in and diluting the word of God. That's their mistake. God has told us that we will face persecution. We will face hardships. We will suffer in our own personal lives in all sorts of ways. But not once did God say that we were allowed to compromise Jesus Christ. Never once. In fact, the opposite is true. Our faith, the perseverance that we have, grows our strength. It makes it stronger. But for some Christians, as we see here in Revelation, the pressure was so much that they said if we just relaxed this or that, everything would be okay. Everything would be okay. We want the same things sometimes. We want the political arguments to stop. We want to get along with everyone. We want to have fun. So we let some doctrines slid here and there or go away here and there. And we invite in the devil to twist God's word. It is the job and duty and calling of our elders with us ministers supporting them to never compromise the word of God. Because when they do, things change. Some churches, they want to double or triple in size. And if they get rid of the things that people don't want to hear, well, a lot of times it works. Now, we are so blessed to have such great attendance and membership here. But it's not worth growing if we're throwing away the doctrines of God. It's not worth it. We have to stay firm in the teachings of God's word. So we have to stay strong with doctrine. Doctrine cannot be compromised. The teachings of God cannot be compromised. Jesus Christ never said this is a, a thing that you could either accept or not accept. This is an option. No. When we accept him by faith, when we go into the waters of baptism, it is my goal every time to ask that person, do you understand the step you're about to take? Because I'm asking them that baptism is the culmination of you giving your entire life to God. You are given yourself over to Jesus Christ. You are accepting him as Lord and Savior. And the part that says you're accepting him as Lord means you're going to accept the consequences of proclaiming him as Lord. It means not being popular. It means not always being the most liked in the community. And sometimes in some places of the world, in certain times, it might mean your life is on the line. Because when you commit to Jesus Christ, you're taking on a whole new life and a whole new responsibility. So if anyone ever wonders why, that's the first thing I ask. Do you understand the step you're about to take? I'm not saying it to deter people. I'm saying it to prepare them for the new life they're going to have in Christ. Because Christ doesn't want people half in, in any way, shape, or form. It's all in, or it's not in at all. So we need to maintain the doctrines, and stand firm in its teachings. Now, while we're maintaining that doctrine, what goes hand in hand with this is maintaining the standards of our lives, or more specifically, the standards that God expects us to live by. One of the biggest problems that these false teachers brought into these churches that we're talking about was the introduction of a wide variety of sexual sin. When we lose grip of God's teachings, we start to go on a slippery slope. You ever heard that term, a slippery slope? Some people don't like that term. They think it might be overused or cliche, but sin is a slippery slope. It can start with something that you and I perceive to be so simple and minor. But if that sin is allowed to flourish and to grow and to spread, people become numb to that sin. And then it doesn't take much time for other sins to slowly lose their effect. We have to understand 
that sin can be forgotten about. The effects of it can be forgotten about. When we disregard sin, we lose sight of holiness. Adultery and premarital sex become standard, then heterosexual sin, then homosexual sin, and then it just gets worse and worse from there. We're not picking out one sin over the other. We're talking about all sin. We're talking about all sin that affects other sins. We're talking about the standards of our lives. When we lose Loosen our grip on the teachings of God, it means we're loosening the standards that God has set for us. When we disregard a passage, when we try to twist a passage to fit our lifestyle, we're welcoming in sin that had no business being there in the first place. But because you have loosened your standards on teachings, now your entire life is open for the devil to prey on. The Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, protects us, enlightens us, teaches us. And when we start tearing pages out of the book, we're starting to tear down the barriers that protect us. It's no surprise that we hear brothers and sisters falling for such sins all the time. And it's not just sexual sin, but any sin that we allow to derail our lives away from Christ. We're all going to struggle and fall down in our lives, but never, ever should we allow our standards allow the standards of this world to dictate how our life is going to be laid out. That job belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone. The culture we live in, the world we live in, the political landscape we live in, none of that should ever determine your life. None of it. No matter where you live, no matter who you're related to, no matter what political party you belong to, no matter what influences your life, Only Jesus Christ has the right to tell you how to live. And that started back when you confessed faith in him and were baptized. Because once again, as I say, you took on a huge responsibility. The responsibility of following the ways and teachings of Jesus Christ. In all of this, we need to be careful to think that we won't be compromised by the world. We have to be on our toes. Many Christians are confident, but sometimes that confidence can lead to arrogance. And they start to think that no sin and no temptation can penetrate their armor. But when we start forgetting that we are sinful creatures in need of God's power every day, we start to weaken ourselves. We put down our defenses. And we allow the things that shouldn't to come in and to affect us. Speaking of that, let me, let me read to you the seal motto or the motto, that's on, the motto that's on the seal of America's first university. This is what it said, for Christ and church. It was in Latin, and that's all it said. The first university of our nation, even before the nation was founded as a nation, the very first official academic logo that was on a seal of a university said, for Christ and church. Doesn't that cover it all? That university was Harvard University. Now, Harvard is the bastion of secular philosophy. So I ask you, like I asked you about the churches, what happened to Harvard? What happened in the 200-some-odd years? They compromised. They compromised here, they compromised there, a little bit there, a little bit more here, and eventually Christ and church is no longer the official motto. You still see it on some things, but now it's just about truth. But whose truth? Certainly not the truth of Jesus. They compromised and they lost their identity. And I would say that is a simple but powerful example that as Christians... We can lose our identity when we compromise. The world is supposed to know that we belong to Jesus through our love for one another and the way we love God and the way we live our life for God. But if we're not doing those things, they'll no longer recognize us as Christians. If we don't stand for what God stands for, and if we're not loving each other the way God has loved us, we are no longer identifiable as Christians. Because we've compromised the things that will identify us, and no longer are we witnesses to this world, the salt and light to this world. 
Never compromise the word of God. Never retain God's standards of doctrine and life so that we don't lose our identity in Christ. I never want this church to be known as a church that at some point gave up the teachings of God. They're known for this. As long as Kenny's here, it's not happening. Some churches are not known for that anymore. Some churches that were bastions of evangelism are now their community service buildings. This church and all churches that believe in God and his word need to not compromise so that they can be identified as a body that trusts in the Lord and stands by his word and his standards of life. Let's learn from the Russian proverb and from the word of God that compromise can cost us of our identity. As we come to a close here today, we come to a time of invitation. And there's no amount of compromise with yourself and there's no amount of compromise with this world that's ever going to save you. Nothing within yourself and nothing outside in this world can save you. The only thing you can do is accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through faith. That's it. So today, if that is your need, we call upon you and encourage you to come forward through repentance to confess him as Lord and Savior and be baptized. Or if you are a Christian who has compromised, because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, we all might compromise somewhere in our Christian walk. But if you have compromised to the point where you know that you are no longer on the side of Christ, that your identity is not Christ, we call you to come forward and rededicate yourself publicly to Christ, to his service and to the faith in him. If you're looking for a church home, if you're a immersed believer and wish to place your membership, we also would love for you to come forward and do that. Or any prayer requests or anything you need, don't hesitate as we stand and sing Song of Invitation. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that can ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing. No turning back, I've been set free. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in. my all and all the joy of my salvation and this hope will never fail cause heaven is our home yeah. through every storm my soul will sing Jesus is here to God be the glory. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I Jesus, no turning back. 
No turning back I have decided To follow Jesus No turning back No turning back The cross before me The world's behind me No turning back No turning back The cross before me The world behind me No turning back No turning back Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me And everything I need is in Everything I need, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in you. Everything I need, I have decided. Follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Good morning. Good morning, Tom. If this is your first time here, we are really happy that you have chosen to come to Jarvisburg today, and we would like to invite you to stop by the Welcome Center as you leave and uh, give us some information about you, and uh, we'll give you some information about us. We have a little gift for you as well, and we would love for you to stop by there. If you've been coming recently and haven't stopped by yet, uh, do it today. We would love to know more about you and your uh, desires to be a part of this church or, or whatever is going on in your life, we want to know about it, and we would invite you to come and stop by that Welcome Center. Uh, also, I want to call your attention to the bulletin. It's full of announcements today. A couple of things I want to point out. Number one, the nursing home ministry is today at Barco Nursing Home, 2 o'clock. If you are a part of that team, be sure and be involved. If you would like to be a part of that team, I'm sure they would like to have you. And if you'll see Susan Fisher, uh, she'll be able to uh, connect you with uh, whatever uh, you would need to know about that ministry. Also, we have some kids and adults that have been at the Carolina Christian Youth Convention in Winston-Salem uh, since Friday, and they will be traveling home today. Uh, if you would say a prayer for them, I know they would appreciate that. Uh, we owe a lot of thanks to the uh, to Doug and Mickey and Paula Wilkinson for uh, going and uh, chaperoning, and, and uh, it's been a good uh, uh, convention as far as Facebook stories are telling us, so uh, we're glad that they were able to go and be a part of it. Also notice that there's an announcement about connect groups. Uh, Ron is seeking uh, out those in the early 20 to late 30 age range who might would be interested in a connect group, and he would like to ask you to stop by the table over here and sign up for that uh, if you would be uh, uh, interested in it. Uh, a couple of weeks, he's probably going to have a little uh, meeting to discuss it further, but if you have any interest at all, uh, please be uh, signing up today uh, before you leave. And also, notice in your bulletin, and I want to say publicly, uh, thank you to Bill Blaylock 
for serving as a deacon at Jarvisburg Church of Christ. Bill's been a faithful deacon for a long time, and he is uh, stepping down. However, he will continue to oversee the communion preparation, and uh, if you are involved in that ministry, uh, still look to him for direction uh, for that. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet for the women's breakfast, so don't get that mixed up with the other sign-up sheet. You might be signing up for the wrong thing, so... Uh, also, I want to tell you that uh, the service for uh, Candy Pittman's mom will be here at Jarvisburg uh, on Saturday, this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock. It's uh, not in the bulletin, but it's on the prayer sheet at the bottom in the bereavement area as a reminder to you. And let's come and show our support for Candy and Ben and that family uh, as they have the service for uh, their mom on Saturday. Let's stand for our benediction. Lord, our desire is to be faithful to you, to be faithful to death, to someday hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. And We know to do that, we need the help of your Holy Spirit and your word. Help us to be not just hearers, but doers of your word. Help us to never compromise your word, but to be faithful to it as we live our lives each day. We want everyone to follow Jesus, and we pray that you would help us to follow him and to convince others to follow as well. Thank you for the privilege of being here today. We ask that you would bless us as we go our separate ways. Through Jesus our Lord we pray, amen. You're the God of the city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to this restless, you are. There's no one like our God. There is no one like our God. For greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. And greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God of the city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. For greater things have yet to come. And greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. And greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. And greater things are still to be done in this city. 
There is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. For greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done. We believe, we believe in you, God. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done here. 